Taking a ski or snow trip to Vail can be expensive, super crowded, and just overwhelming by the sheer vast amount of terrain and skiable acres that Vail has to offer. But that being said, with the right game plan, the right tips and tricks, that trip to Vail can be absolutely one of the best ski or snowboard vacations that you and your family have ever taken, and some of the best riding that you may have ever done. Vail, when done right, is truly like no place on earth. So in this video, I'm gonna break it into four different categories and give you all the tips and tricks that are gonna fall into each one of those categories to help you have the absolute best ski or snowboard vacation that you've ever taken and help you try to maximize your time at Vail so you can spend more time riding, less time in the lift lines. And that way you're gonna have everything you need and these are all tips and tricks that I wish I knew when I went to Vail and I think will be really helpful to you all. Because my number one goal with this video is to help you have the best possible day on the mountain. So this first category that I want to cover is not just only specific to Vail, but any Colorado resorts or any high altitude resort that you are going to visit. Because if you are coming from a low altitude or you're someone that hasn't been to a higher altitude like that, it is going to make a difference on your trip and it is going to have an impact on your body. So I want to help share with you some tips that can help you best cope and deal with that higher altitude climate being to be able to properly acclimate so that you can have the best trip not get altitude sickness because nobody wants to sit a day or two out because they're not feeling good or having issues breathing but typically what we do is we fly in on a saturday we'll spend that whole day saturday getting settled in sunday we'll go out explore the village walk around run some errands that way we take like a day and a half to acclimate and we don't actually start snowboarding till monday but if you are someone who knows you're super prone to altitude sickness, you may want to stay in Denver for a day. That way you can acclimate there and then travel to the ski resorts. That way you start off at one altitude, rest there for a little bit, and then go to that higher elevation that you're going to find once you get into the mountains. We've never actually done this, but if you are someone who's super prone to altitude sickness, definitely may want to be something you consider. Typically just taking that day and a half for us to kind of walk around and move physically but not anything super strenuous at that higher altitude climate has been perfectly fine with us and we've never really ran into any issues and that is one of the great things about going to Vail is that they do have a massive village so you have plenty of stuff to walk around and look at it's also a tip if you are planning to go skiing or snowboarding at Vail and you have somebody in your family who's a non-skier that massive village is another great feature about Vail that's going to give them something to do while you're out there having a good time on the mountain they can be cozy in the village having a great time too so the Vail Village is massive, and you can walk the entire village if you want to. It's split up into three different villages, but one of the great things about Vail is they do have a free shuttle system once you are in the village that can shuttle you from any of the three different parts of the village to get all around. So if you don't want to walk, or you're trying to get from one section to the other, you can take the free public shuttles. Super easy to follow and uh, just a great way to help get around. Also, the streets of Vail are heated, so when you are walking around, going to eat, shopping, all that stuff, the streets stay nice and warm. It helps keep the ice off and keep you a little bit more comfortable when you are walking around. So to help, I always pack a box of Acclimate with me. And what Acclimate is, is a powdered, basically sports drink mix. You're gonna put it into your water and it's got some stuff in there to help you cope with the altitude and some things that are gonna alleviate the symptoms of altitude sickness if you are having it. I never go to Colorado without this. I've always used it anytime one of us does like my wife, for example, one time started to feel the effects of altitude sickness. She would drink a packet of this and it seemed to really help her out. The other great thing about this is one of the best ways you can combat altitude sickness is by staying super hydrated. And so by giving you just a delicious drink mix to kind of put into your water, it makes it a little bit easier to try to drink several bottles of water throughout the day. You definitely want to stay super hydrated. I typically drink three packets of Acclimate a day when I am in Colorado. Um, one in the morning, one on the mountain while I'm riding, and then one right before bed or when I get home from the mountain that way. I've got tons of water just going into me and I try to stay as hydrated as possible. Another great thing that you can do to help combat altitude sickness is all over Colorado. You're gonna see them in grocery stores, little convenience stores, everywhere. You're gonna be able to find these anywhere. They have these little boost oxygen cans and if you are suddenly feeling like severe symptoms of altitude sickness or you're having trouble catching your breath or you're short-winded. My buddy Jared utilized the heck out of these when we went and it's basically just a little can of like flavored oxygen. You just go and it's gonna, it really, really helps you out. And I mean, my buddy Jared, like I said, he lived off these while we were in Colorado. So first time I went to Colorado, I picked one up and now I recommend them to people that have never been. I still might get a small one just to have as a backup because you never know just a couple bucks and that way it can help you out. It's better than feeling sick. Before I go any further, I do want to mention all these 
things that you can bring, different things, all that's gonna be linked down in the description below with links. It's gonna really help this channel out if you use any of these links, but as well, I'm trying to make it easy for you to be able to find all these pieces of gear or anything that I mentioned. That way it's all right there in one spot so you can pick it up before you go on your trip. Another great thing that you can pack with you is a portable humidifier. You can pick these up for fairly cheap and with the higher altitude, the dry air, if you're not used to it, it again, one of those things that can just make you feel those altitude sickness effects potentially more. And so packing one of these little humidifiers is a great way to help keep you in a more humid climate while you're sleeping. And because a lot of the rooms are gonna come with a humidifier, but they, we found that sometimes they don't always work. So it's great to just have one of these to throw in your bag, it's lightweight, and that way you can keep a good, good amount of moisture in the air for you. I do wanna just touch on this just in case you don't know. I'm not personally a drinker, but if you are somebody who wants to go out and have some drinks at the end of the night after your day on the mountain, you might wanna avoid it for those first few days because that's gonna dehydrate you a little bit more and anything that dehydrates you is gonna make you more prone to altitude sickness, as well as if you're coming from a low elevation climate to a high elevation, when you do have any of that, it's gonna hit you three times as hard. So definitely just something to be aware of. Again, you might just wanna take the first couple days before you, you know, have any of that. So just something I thought I would mention. But let's get into what to pack. Lift tickets. You definitely wanna go on and buy your lift tickets ahead of time. Your best bet is to buy a multi-day Epic Pass because the lift tickets for single day lift tickets avail are something crazy like $225, $250 a day. If you buy that multi-day Epic Pass, it's gonna make it a whole lot more affordable for you, especially if you're doing multiple days. And it just makes it far more simpler, it's cheaper, and the best way to get a good deal on the Epic Pass is to buy as early as possible. The sooner you know that you're planning your trip, go on and book that Epic Pass because as it gets closer and closer to the actual season, the prices do steadily increase so if you want to get the best bang for your buck book your trip as early as possible and buy that epic pass really really soon a lot of times that's one of the first things we buy before we even book anything else just so that we go on and get those best prices next i would say to pack a backpack because you're going to a bigger mountain resort i like to always carry a backpack with me that way i've got one i can carry all the extra essentials and things that i'm going to need that i'm going to mention later in this video just makes it super helpful to be able to have that handy on your back so you don't have to constantly be going down to the bottom of the village to pick those things up. You can just carry those smaller items with you on your back. That way you're good to go. But typically in my backpack, I'll pack an extra base layer in case it does get cold because the mountain on these, the climate on these bigger mountains can change rapidly. So you wanna make sure you're heavily prepared for all the different weather changes. So it's always nice to pack an extra dry base layer, pack extra goggle lenses because variable conditions can happen up on the mountain. Weather can change any second. I do wanna take a moment just to shout out my goggle sponsor. Outdoor Master. I love packing these extra lenses because they are magnetic. Makes that goggle lens change really fast, really easy. These are linked in the description below as well with a promo code. I also always bring extra set of gloves because typically about halfway through the day, your gloves are gonna either become saturated with snow or just sweat from your hand. And it's nice to have a nice dry pair of gloves to switch out halfway through the day, I found for me makes a huge difference. I like to keep my hands comfortable. So I always just throw those in the backpack. And if I don't need them, you know, it's not like it's adding really any extra weight. And if I do, it just makes a huge difference for me in terms of comfort about halfway through the day. I love putting on a nice dry pair of gloves, kind of give me like a, a second wind to get back going after we take a lunch break. I also always keep my Burton hood and I keep that in the backpack because what it does is a great job of just blocking the wind out off of my head. And because the Colorado winds can be cold and harsh because you're up at that high elevation. So I like to be able to just have that to throw on real quick if I need it, if it's cold and windy, or a lot of times I'll wear it in the morning when it's real cold. And then once it warms up a little bit, take it off and stick it in the backpack. Again, it's just something super lightweight. It's gonna help me stay comfortable. And I wanna be able to be out on the mountain as long as possible. I also like to throw some hot hands in there in case it is really cold. If I know it's gonna be cold ahead of time, I'll put some hot hands in my backpack. That way, if I do need just any sort of extra warmth, it's there, I put them in my gloves, pockets, jacket pockets, wherever I basically need heat. And lastly, I like to put snacks in my backpack. When I'm out there snowboarding at these big mountains, I paid all this money to go and snowboard here, so I don't wanna spend time you know, waiting, going down to the village to have lunch and this and that. I try to eat a big breakfast enough snacks to keep me throughout the day and then I'll eat dinner at the end of the day but I like to just throw some quick snacks in my backpack that way I don't ever have to really stop riding I can eat them on the lift the gondola wherever and that way I can just snowboard as much as possible while I'm there and not spend waste time eating or waiting for a table this and that so next on the list is actually getting to Vail when going to Vail you have two options you can fly into the Denver Airport which is about two two and a half hours away 
or you can fly into the Eagle County Airport, which is only about 35 minutes away. Now, what I have found is obviously the Eagle Airport is a smaller airport, so it's gonna be a little more expensive to fly into. However, you're gonna to have to either take a shuttle or a rental car, and the shuttles might be cheaper from Eagle because it is a shorter drive versus the shuttles from Denver as well as if your party size is big enough you might want to look into getting a rental car when we went we had five people in our party and it wound up being cheaper for us to get a rental car versus taking the shuttle so we flew into denver booked a rental car we used noon rental cars and that wound up being the cheapest and it saved us about 400 dollars total amongst our party to have that rental car versus taking a shuttle again you might just want to compare the prices between the different airports shuttle prices rental car prices definitely something to you know, check out so that way you can try to get the best deal possible. One thing to note though with a rental car is obviously you have to have accommodations that are either going to allow for a free parking for your car or if you do drive to Vail, um, Vail does have paid parking and to park at the actual resort is $50 a day. So again, all these different things you just want to factor in before you book your trip. And speaking of accommodations, Staying at a ski in and ski out hotel is great. It's wonderful and I think it's the most convenient option, definitely the best. But when it comes to those at Vail, they do get quite expensive. And so we found it saved us over $1,000 to stay just slightly outside of Vail and then either drive to Vail or they also have public transportation, the eco transportation, it's like two, three dollars each way. And that saved us a tremendous amount of money. We, we stayed in Edwards, Colorado. Once I have it done, I'm gonna have a full video up here just talking about that. But that saved us over $1,000 by just staying like 10 minutes down the road. We would drive, park, and get on the free shuttle. And that way, saved us a ton of money. Maybe not as convenient, but big, big money savings that we can put into other parts of our trip. I did find that the cheapest place to book those accommodations was Airbnb and VRBO. I'll link those below as well. They just typically had the best prices and the best deals compared to booking with a straight hotel or on any other website. So I'd recommend those. One other tip when I talk about getting there, on your way there or take an Uber, go to the grocery store. Whenever we go on these big trips, especially to Vail, Vail has tons of food options, tons, but it can get really, really pricey and really expensive. So we typically will buy groceries, we'll eat breakfast in the room, like I said, I throw snacks in my backpack, and then we'll splurge on dinner. That way we're not going out to eat for every single meal. We have plenty of groceries and snacks to keep us full in our room, and then we'll spend our money when we do wanna have a nice expensive dinner, we'll do that for dinner time and not all throughout the day. All right, so now the part you've actually been waiting for, the part you've probably been looking forward to the most, actually snowboarding or skiing at Vail. The game plan. You want to have some sort of a game plan when going to Vail because Vail is best enjoyed on a Monday through Thursday. I've heard Fridays is a little bit more crowded and Saturdays and Sundays we've all seen the legendary pictures of how crowded it gets. You just you don't want to do that on your ski vacation. So Monday through Thursday is going to be your best day to enjoy Vail Resort. Now in terms of riding on Vail, the front of the mountain is going to have your more beginner and intermediate terrain. It has a couple more advanced runs sprinkled throughout there, but it's largely your beginner intermediate terrain. Then when you go onto the back side of Vail, that's where you're going to find the majority of your advanced terrain. There's no green runs back there. There's a couple blues that's mainly all black diamond and up runs. So definitely when you're planning out where you want to go on the mountain, the back is going to be for you more advanced riders. The front a good mixture of everything, but again, more beginner intermediate. One of the ways that we dictated where we rode throughout the day was that Vail has really great signs, TVs, as well as, you, as well as if you download the Epic Mix app on your phone. It's a really great way to be able to track the lift times, the wait times, all that, and you can kind of gauge how crowded each area is, and we use this just to dictate. We would go wherever was in close proximity to us and had the lowest wait time, we'd go there and ride in that area, and that allowed us to spend more time riding, less time waiting in lift lines. We really liked this area here, and the great thing about it was it had a great mix of terrain. Our, in our party, we had different skill levels of riders, and this area was really great because it allowed us all to kind of ride together, but be able to split off on our own little individual paths, more advanced, easy, and kind of come back together. Plus, it had a lot of multiple lift options to so choose which one had the less wait time of the chairlifts. In terms of talking about the back bowls of Vail, because they are legendary, they make up over 70% of Vail skiable acres, if it is a powder day, 
and you want to make the most out of that powder day, you want to go straight to the end. And if you're a more advanced rider, you want to go straight to the back bowls as soon as they open. That's going to give you the best snow. It's so vast and wide. You're going to be able to get untouched lines for a little while. It's going to be the best way to enjoy the back bowls on a powder day. However, if it's not a powder day, you want to stay on the front side of the mountain and let those back bowls soften up a little bit from the sun because otherwise you're going to be riding down straight sheets of ice and that's no fun nobody wants to do that so let those soften up a little bit go later in the day and then to contrast that on a powder day the front is going to be a little bit less crowded because everybody is going to the back bowl so depending on what you're trying to accomplish the front might not be a bad spot to start on the powder day either but then again if you do do that you're going to miss any powder in the back bowls because it's going to all be gone if you go later in the day so that's a choice you're going to have to make when it comes to skiing or snowboarding veil on a powder day. Another tip about the back bowls is don't go to them if you are tired. It does take quite a bit to get down there, to get all the way back there, and as well as to come back. So if you are feeling tired, I would save them for the next day. That way you have a fresh set of legs because you don't want to get all the way back there, realize you're too tired to ride it, and then have to work your way back to the front. And because Vail is so massive, depending on where you need to get to in the village at the end of the day, it may take you several different laps to get back to where you need to go. One thing I do want to touch on with that is when you're going to the back bowls to get to the different back bowls, you can take a cat track to kind of snake your way along and drop into the one you want. Now, this is the easier route. However, it is incredibly exhausting. The cat track is much longer than you would anticipate. I think honestly, if you have the skills to do it, it would be far easier to ride down each bowl and kind of diagonally cut your way across. Yes, it's going to be harder terrain. But for you snowboarders out there, you know riding a cat track can really just take a toll on your legs. I think it'd be far easier to go down these more advanced runs and work your way diagonally that way across. Keep taking the chairlifts and cutting your way over versus, like I said, it is a long, long cat track to snake your way over. We took it to get to the China Bowl and I, looking back now, if we go back, we'll definitely just drop straight into the bowls and work our way over that way because the cat track, especially on a snowboard, it, it sucks. So you don't want to do that. I'm trying to save you all that trouble because by the time we got to the China Ball 1, it took forever. Two, we were kind of tired and didn't get to do as many runs as we would have liked. Also, just why I am touching on the back bowls as well, I recommend leaving them a little bit early because the lifts can get crowded getting out of there if you wait till the last minute, as well as the back bowls close 30 minutes earlier than the rest of the mountain. The rest of the mountain closes at 4, the back bowl area is closed at 3.30, but I'd recommend leaving a little bit sooner than that because that line, all the trails basically funnel into this one spot to get back up and over the mountain. And if you don't wanna get caught in a long lift line, go on and leave a little extra early just to give yourself time to get out of there. So I hope you found these tips and tricks helpful. I absolutely love Vail. I've done a full resort review, which I will link up here as well as down in the description below. It's definitely one of my favorite resorts that we've ever been to. The village is massive, it's super enjoyable, and it's just all around a really great place. Loved riding there. There's laps and terrain for everybody every skill level of rider anything you could want Vail's gonna have it so can't recommend it enough again if you want more on that watch this resort review and uh, be my third favorite ski resort that I've ever been to if you all have any other tips leave those down in the comments below help anybody out who's coming to this video for tips and tricks that way we can make this one great place for the ski and snowboard community to come and get all sorts of different tips and tricks for going to Vail if you did find this helpful, please smash that like button. Consider subscribing. I'm Alex from Boards, Bikes, and Hikes. I post all sorts of snowboard, hiking, biking, all sorts of travel-related videos. I'm going to try to do more vlogs this season, as well as I love to post these tips, tricks, reviews, anything that I can do to share with my travel adventures and help make it easier or better for you all. That's my main goal, is just to be able to help people out with as many different resorts as possible, recommend what resort for who, and thank you guys for taking the time to watch me. I hope your snowboard season's already started. Mine, it's got to be coming within the next week, and I'm just frothing and ready to get out. So thank you guys for watching. I'm Alex from Boards, Bikes, and Hikes. I'll see you in the next one soon.